Thank you for uh, your invitation. The uh, subject that I want to, to bring to you this morning is um, a subject that my attention was drawn to. Um, I can trace it back now to May 2017. And um, it, it is a subject that um, is intrinsic to the, to, the, uh, to the Bible. And it's something that I have been convicted of um, over this time and personally uh, need to do something about. And is this that I want to share with you this morning. The subject is the gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, as I started reading through the New Testament late last year, uh, I decided to record every reference to the gospel. And I may have missed a few, but I think I got them most. And uh, there were over 60 references, and over half of those references to the gospel are in the context of preaching. And it is this that um, I am convicted of, um, personally, that I must preach the gospel more than I do. And so I want to share this with you, and hopefully it will be of benefit to you. So if you want to turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Let's just uh, read from verse 18, if we can. 2 Corinthians 5, from verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to him through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And this is our verse. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And though God were pleading, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. To God, Well, if I could try to just bring five things out of that verse initially. Um, sorry, uh, three things out of that verse initially. Firstly, ambassadors. If we look at, at what an ambassador is. And then secondly, God pleading through us. And thirdly, we implore you. So firstly, the ambassador. What is an ambassador. Well, the biblical definition for the word ambassador is one who is appointed by God to do his will. One who is appointed by God to do his will. We are ambassadors for Christ. The Bible tells us this. And an ambassador is given a message, and he is given that message from a higher authority. What is that message? Well, if you just look at the end of verse 19, the message has been committed to us, and it is the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation of the sinner back to God. That message is the message of the gospel. So we're ambassadors, and we are given a message from a higher authority. And what are we to do? Well, we are obligated, we are obliged to deliver that message, we don't have a choice. An ambassador doesn't have a choice. If we could use the, the parallel of, of an ambassador in the political realm, perhaps given a, a message from a, a president of a country to deliver to perhaps another uh, minister of another country, that ambassador is obliged to take that message. Mark 16 tells us that we are obliged to take that message. The Great Commission, Jesus commissions his disciples to publicly proclaim the good news, to preach the gospel to all. And what of the question when? Well, think back to Paul's conversion as a good example of this. Paul was converted in Damascus. Ananias came and spoke to him. He was baptized. He took food. And then what? Immediately, the word says, immediately, 
he went and preached Christ in the synagogues. Similarly, 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll come to this in a moment, but the words there say, and this is Paul speaking, for what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. What I received, I passed on to you of first importance. There's a sense of urgency here, a sense of necessity immediately of first importance. This message has to be delivered. Just think of this for a moment. Consider this, the devil knows his time is short and he roams around and prowls like a roaring lion, the Bible says. And what a terrible thought that is, but he knows his time is short. Now, does the Christian know that our time is short in the sense of delivering the gospel message that we've been given? Why would we want to delay a sinner hearing the good news and having the opportunity to find Christ? Why would we want to delay that moment? Do we know the sense of urgency that is applied to this message that we have to, be, to deliver? Fourth thing then, we're not permitted to change this message. We don't have authority to do so. In Galatians, uh, we read verses, uh, from verse 6 in the chapter, first chapter, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, to you than what is pre than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. We're not permitted to change the gospel. There is only one gospel, and it is the power of God unto salvation. It tells us this in Romans, the gospel that has been delivered to us, given to us from a higher authority, is the power of God. We don't need to add anything to it, and we certainly shouldn't take anything away from it. It is perfect in its, in its essence. It is the power of God unto salvation. So there is no need for us to change it. We must just proclaim it. Uh, the last point under this uh, heading of ambassadors is that we shouldn't be put off by those that are to hear the message. We shouldn't be put off. It says in the Bible, doesn't it, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And we will come up against those that do not want to listen, that those will ridicule us, those will just laugh at us, those that plain just won't listen. But we shouldn't be put off by that we should still deliver that message so we are ambassadors ambassadors of christ given a message from a higher authority we have a an urgency to deliver it without alteration and we shouldn't be affected by those that we are to deliver it to secondly um in this verse we see the words, God pleading through us. Well, th this is tremendous. This really struck me. God pleading through us. Excuse me. God, almighty, creator God, pleading through us. The divine pleading through the mortal and the mortal sinner. Just consider that for a moment, what a privilege it therefore is for us to have been trusted with this message. 1 Timothy 1.11 speaks of the glorious gospel of the blessed God which has been committed to our trust. What a privilege that God, the divine, has entrusted us, the mere mortal, with his plan of salvation to the lost. What a privilege this is for us to convey God's message. But not only a privilege, and this is something that I consider um, with, with all carefulness and, and seriousness, but the responsibility. And as I stand here this morning, I am conscious of the fact 
that a mere mortal, a weak and empty vessel, is trying to explain the profundities of the mysteries of Almighty God contained in his word to you. And I have a responsibility to do that accurately, and I'm conscious of that. We could think of verses in the Bible, couldn't we? Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or in Isaiah, it speaks of his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. I could consider Job and his remonstrations with his friends and the many words that he said to God. And then God spoke, chapter 38, out of the whirlwind. And God said to him, who is this that darkens counsel with words without knowledge? And I am aware of this, acutely aware that I have a responsibility to convey to you reverently and accurately the things of God from his word. And so we should be too when we are conveying this message to others. The privilege of it, the responsibility of it, careful and diligent. Paul speaks to Timothy and he says you must correctly handle this word of truth. God pleading through us. Thirdly, we implore you, ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to him. In the Amplified, it says, we, as Christ's personal representatives, beg you for his sake to lay hold of the divine favor now offered you and be reconciled to him. Personal representatives of Christ. Have we considered that this morning? We implore you. Just think of those words. We implore you. This, this isn't a casual invite to hear the gospel. We're not merely to allude to it. It's not something that can be conveyed in our lives solely by actions. We implore, here is the obligation to deliver the message. Here the obligation is manifested, if you like. Here we have the opportunity to plead God's case to the lost. Here we must represent Christ in our appeals to sinners to come to him and it will require courage it will require boldness and it will require the help of the holy spirit to implore people on christ's behalf be reconciled to him so we have been chosen as ambassadors the gospel has been committed to our trust we are charged with the commission to take it to all that will listen and we are responsible and accountable, perhaps, to handle it correctly. But in order to do this, we, we have to have an understanding of it. We have to have a working knowledge of it. And we have to be able to, to articulate it to people. And if we don't fully understand it, then how are we to convey it to others effectively? So we've looked at, at, at being ambassadors and given a message and told to deliver it. But what of that message? Are we fully aware of, of what that message should be when we have the opportunity to share? Just turn back in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me just share with you four essential elements of the gospel and here in this passage there are, are contained three 1 corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 moreover brethren i declare to you the gospel which i preached to you which also you received and in which you stand by which you also are saved if you hold fast the word which i preached to you unless you believed in vain here it is for i delivered to you first of all of first importance, some translations say. For I delivered to you of first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again 
on the third day according to the scriptures. So four essential elements of the gospel I suggest to you are firstly sin, secondly Christ's work on the cross, thirdly Christ's resurrection from the dead and fourthly the free gift of salvation and three are contained in this passage sin christ's work on the cross and the resurrection so what of sin well the bible tells us quite clearly doesn't it in romans we can read that the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness we read that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god and that the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life all have sinned sin separates us from god and if the sinner remains in that state then the sinner will be separated from god for eternity that's what the bible says and that separation in eternity is in a place called hell that is what the bible says john the baptist jesus christ both came preaching a gospel of repentance from sin in order for the sinner to come to that position the sinner must realize that their sin the, the bible tells us that an awareness of this sin brings around godly sorrow godly sorrow produces repentance and repentance salvation so it is important that we explain these things sin separates from god the second, Christ reconciles to God. Back into 2 Corinthians chapter 5 again, those verses that we read. 18 and 19, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to him, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You know, this goes back to the incarnation, doesn't it? God's plan of salvation started with the incarnation of Christ as a baby. You can read in Colossians, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. Christ, fully man, fully God, God in the flesh, born of a virgin, a baby, lived a perfect life, died a perfect death john the baptist proclaimed didn't he behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world this was the purpose that god incarnate in the flesh went to the cross to take away the sin of the world man can do nothing to save himself christ's work on the cross his death his shed blood provides the only way for the sinner to be reconciled to God. The apostles preached this, and this is the lesson that we need to learn. The apostles preached Christ, and they preached Christ crucified. They preached the cross of Christ. Sin separates, but faith in Christ and the grace of God by which man can be reconciled back to God. The third most essential part of uh, our gospel message is the resurrection. Sin separates, Christ reconciles, but the resurrection provided a victory over death. We can read in John's gospel, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Christ not only died on the cross, but Christ was resurrected from the dead. From the dead. Christ's death dealt with man's sin, appeased the wrath of a holy God, and his resurrection provided for the believer life eternal the resurrection and the fourth aspect of free gift 
We've already heard, haven't we, that by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves it is a free gift. Ephesians 2, verse 8. There is nothing that we can do except come to Christ. Perhaps you've never responded to the gospel call. Perhaps you've heard it. Maybe you're familiar with it. But perhaps you've never responded to it. And would be remiss of me not to bring to your attention the importance of the gospel. We've heard that sin separates man, he's separated from God. Man needs to be reconciled back to God, and there is only one way through faith and belief in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, his shed blood and his death and his resurrection. And that is the only way that man can be reconciled back to God. That is the message that we need to take to others. This is the glorious gospel of the blessed God, 1 Timothy 1 verse 11. We should be bold in proclaiming it, not ashamed of it. Romans says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I mentioned earlier that it was uh, May 17 that my mind perhaps could be traced back to this subject and it was just in there in the foyer. Sat watching the door on a Tuesday night I picked up a book out of the bookcase and uh, I'd like to find it actually after. If I could borrow it from you, that would be good. Um, it said these words in it, a commentary on, uh, on Romans, I think it was. And with regard to, I am not ashamed of the gospel, it said this, although the apostle is proud of the gospel, <coughs> he is not unaware of the gospel and its general contempt in which it is held. And so he prefers to say he is not ashamed of it. The unpopularity of a crucified Christ has prompted many to present a message which is more palatable to the unbeliever. But the removal of the offence of the cross always renders it ineffective. An inoffensive gospel is an inoperative gospel. And therefore Christianity is wounded most in the house of its friends. Strong words perhaps, but words that we should consider. There is no salvation without the preaching of the gospel. Romans 10. Romans 10 verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 17. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, I said to you earlier that I was convicted of this in my own personal life. And I was aware that I would perhaps preach on this subject one day. But for me to be able to stand here and tell you that you should preach the gospel more, in your homes, in your families, in your work, in your social circles, in your church. For me to stand here and tell you that you must do that, it would be hypocritical of me if I wasn't doing something similar. And so these convictions weighed heavy. Weighed heavy upon me to the point that I realised There were people that I brush shoulders with on a regular basis that know that I'm a Christian. They know where I stand. I mention God. I mention the Bible. I might mention Jesus if I'm really bold. But have I ever preached the gospel to them?
I have a group of friends that I grew up with from the age of four. Two of which are no longer with us. The one, his views on God were errant and I never corrected him. The other was an atheist. I did manage to speak to him before he passed away. But I don't think I conveyed the gospel. Not fully. There's ten left. And a week or so ago, I sat them down and told them, it was remiss of me as a Christian not to have ever shared the gospel with them. And we sat there and for probably 20 minutes, I told them about sin. I told them about Jesus. I told them about the cross. I told them about the blood, his resurrection, heaven and hell. I went to work last week and I was conscious of the fact that there was another group of people that I needed to speak to. And the first one was an atheist. I've spoken to him before, he knows I'm a Christian. And uh, it makes it easier in a way because when people know you're a Christian, they kind of expect you to say something. So I did. I thought, well, I'm going to go for it. And I, I told him about Christ. I told him about salvation, only being through the cross. He laughed a bit. But I told him. I tried with some others as well, but, you know, sometimes you can't preach the gospel. I couldn't get a word in. As soon as I opened the subject, this lad, he, he, it was as though he, he knew what was coming and he didn't want to hear it. Maybe he was frightened of it, but he kept yapping away and he, I couldn't get a word in edgeways. And in that particular instance, I, I chose not to pursue it. But I shall have to pick it up again with him. There's other areas that I need to get to as well our families and so I, I feel like I can stand here this morning and say to you you must preach the gospel these people that we rub shoulders with day in and day out we see them on a daily basis this gospel has been committed to our trust we've been told to take it to the lost I read to you earlier a passage from Matthew's gospel and uh, it's a grave scene. You just imagine with me for a moment. It's the judgment and there's a multitude of people and they stood before Christ on his judgment throne. And he's moving some to his right, to a place of honour, into heaven, to be with our heavenly Father. And he's moving some to his left, to a lost eternity. And there's a great multitude of people. Some going one way. Some going another way. And maybe we'll recognise each other when we're there. There's some justification for that if you read the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man is in hell and he communicates with Abraham and Lazarus in heaven. So there is some justification for this. If we recognize people, some are moving one way, some are moving another and we pass and they look at us and they see us and they realize that we are going to heaven and they're going to hell and we've been sat opposite them at a desk for years or around a table eating lunch with them as a family or in our social circles and they recognize us and they see us and they realize that we are going to heaven and that they are going to hell. What do you think they'd say? 
and they may cry out in desperation, you knew about this. You knew. And you never told me. Folks, that should grieve us. And that should prompt us to be more active in the proclamation of the gospel. Grieved we may well be, but judged we may well be as well. James speaks of sins of omission, sins of commission, doing things that we know is wrong, but sins of omission, not doing the things that we should do. This gospel has been entrusted to us, committed to us. We've been told to proclaim it to the lost. Sins. Sins of omission. Folks, this is the glorious gospel of our blessed God that we have been charged with to take to the lost. Let me close by just using Ephesians 6, 19 and 20 as a prayer. You can follow it through if you wish, but effectively, if I can just paraphrase it and use it as a prayer, Ephesians 6, verse 19. So, Father, our prayer should be that utterance may be given to us, that we may open our mouths boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel of which we are called to be ambassadors for Christ, that we may speak boldly and as we ought to speak. May the Lord add his blessing to the preaching of his word. Amen.